preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 92nd Street Y. Good evening, I am Rabbi David Wozniaka. It's my privilege to be the director of the Y's Bronfman Center for Jewish Life. As is my custom before I introduce uh, our speaker this evening, I will share some thoughts about some programs which are coming up here at the Y in the next weeks, which I think you'll find of interest. I have a little bit of ec an echo in here, right? That's, that's another reason that we always have someone introduce the speaker so we can get the sound exactly right. Um, at the end of this month and early in uh, June, begin a series of courses in Judaica. Um, we are teaching a course in Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, beginning in June. There, these are four-week courses and another one beginning in July. Also, you can join us for a course entitled The Taste of Modern Jewish Literature. Also, a course entitled Cheeseburgers, Candles, Linen, and Leather. The Reason Behind the Commandments, cute title, huh? And a great teacher. If you'd like to study Hebrew with us this, uh, this summer, we have a course in beginning Hebrew, intermediate Hebrew, and a course in intermediate high level Hebrew as well. Also, if you're interested in spending an evening with us for some lectures, as obviously you're all interested in doing, at least uh, as a result of being here this evening, on Thursday night, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin and I complete our third part of our three-part series on the Forum on Contemporary Values. Our goal in this program is to interview a man or woman who we believe has had a significant impact on the political, social, moral, or religious um, elements of American or international society. Um, our program this year began with Max Frankel, who was the executive editor of the New York Times a few months ago. Last week, we were with Dr. Ruth Westheimer, and we close our series on Thursday evening with Barry Sheck, um, notably known for his work in the O.J. Simpson case, but in particular recently for his work with DNA uh, and something he calls the Innocence Project, where he has helped to exonerate some 70-plus men and women who have been apparently wrongly convicted. So you are welcome to join us also tomorrow evening a program with Dr. Robert Brooks entitled Raising Resilient Children, uh, a number of other programs, including the State of the American Press with Ted Koppel, Jeff Greenfield, David Halberstam, and others, and then a wonderful series on uh, history and politics, one evening focusing on John Adams and another evening focusing on the Pentagon Papers 30 years later with Max Frankel returning and Daniel Ellsberg. So these are just a few of, pro of a whole slew of programs which we think you will find of interest. And now for this evening's lecture. Dr. Gerald Schroeder is, as you all know, a world-renowned scientist who received his formal training at MIT where he earned his PhD in two fields, Earth and Planetary Sciences and Nuclear Physics. After teaching at MIT for seven years, he moved to Israel, though his work continues to take him around the world. As a consultant to the United States government, he participated in the formulation of nuclear non-proliferation treaties with the former Soviet Union and witnessed the detonation of six atomic bombs. That's six more atomic bombs than most of us have witnessed. He has also acted as consultant for agencies of the governments of the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Canada, and China. He has over 60 publications in the world's leading scientific journals, and his findings have been reported in Time Magazine, Newsweek, and Scientific American. In Israel, he also teaches at Asia Torah. For the last 20 years, Dr. Schroeder has pursued the study of ancient biblical interpretation. His work has focused on the intersect of science and religion, as captured in his first book, Genesis and the Big Bang, which is now, by the way, available in six languages. And he has just released two weeks ago, The Hidden Face of God, How Science Reveals the Ultimate Truth. Both of those um, books will be available this evening after the lecture, and Dr. Schroeder will happily sign them. One last note. A number of people, I must tell you, including a number, uh, member, several members of the 92nd Street Y Board of Directors, have gone out of their way to uh, tell me how brilliant you are, Dr. Schroeder. So you have a strong reputation, a rather large audience, and all of us eagerly await your thoughts as you speak this evening about Genesis and the Big Bang, Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gerald Schroeder.
it can only be downhill <laughs> from there. <laughs> I mean, uh, but thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Yeah. The uh, uh, topic this evening, this idea of the integration, the shiluv, the, uh, the flowing together of science and Torah, is a fairly controversial one. To try to limit subjectivity as much as possible, it's impossible to, to obliterate subjectivity because the world out there is highly biologically filtered till it gets in to here. What's red to one person is maroon to another, and that's just a color. The reality has also changed. So in an attempt in trying to see whether there's this flow between science and Torah, I've limited my sources of information, and I do that in the books and also the talks, and that is ancient biblical commentary, modern peer-reviewed science. No modern biblical commentary related to the physical universe. We can have a modern commentary on the philosophical aspects. When we're dealing with the physical development, I try to not I try to, I avoid all modern commentary because every commentator knows some science even if they've never studied science at all. And so what's the in, unavailable, un impossibly result? Take the Bible, make it batch the science, or bend the Bible, science, or science to the Bible. So to avoid that problem, the sources of information that we'll, I'll use this evening will be the modern science, and the commentators and the sources will be primarily uh, the text itself, which dates itself at 33, 3,400 years ago. If you don't accept that, it's not less than, the Torah is not less than 2,000 years old. We have from the Dead Sea Scrolls that information. And then the major commentaries, the Talmud redacted in the year about 400, so it's 1,600 years old. The Kabbalah, 1,000, primar primarily Nachmanides, the Ramban, about the year 1250, Maimonides, 1190, major Rashi, 1050, all ancient, hundreds and even thousands of years before the Hubble telescope told us what was going on in the cosmos. The amazing fact is they matched together. The difficulty is convincing people of that. The first, <laughs> in fact, the first, the first lecture I gave, I was, and it wasn't on this topic at all, it, was, it, was, it had to do with natural radiation and the environment, and I was a graduate student, and I hadn't had my, didn't have my PhD, but I was presenting data that are related to my PhD. It was in Houston, Texas. It was, a, it was an international conference, I was fortunate to be there, and uh, there were about 500 people in the audience, not to hear me, they came, you know, I was just one of the many speakers that was addressing the audience. And sitting second row back, just off to my left, it's amazing how things, this is, this is decades and decades ago, just off to my left, was the leader in the field of this particular aspect of natural recurring radiation. So I project my first slide. The data were fairly impressive, I thought. He goes, <laughs> funny it wasn't. <laughs> then comes the next slide data, it was a table, and it was big enough so you could actually read it. He says, no, it does. <laughs> Finally, at the end, a montage of things, and this is going to blow, this is my doctor's thesis, I thought. <laughs> oh, at the end of the talk, he came up and said, that was the best lecture I've ever heard. <laughs> he so the basic problem I have is when people go like this, <laughs> and I really, I really don't know what's about to happen. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's have, um, do it on a diagonal, then I'll be in, uh, in, in question. Okay, so the idea, this evening I think from the, from the uh, announcement that was in the, in the bulletin is more or less one aspect of the many, many topics that are, co that are coverable, that I do cover in the different talks, and we're dealing on one, the time is limited, we're dealing on the age of the universe, okay? The age of the universe has a be several basic problems. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the, the biblical aspect of the world, how it sees it, so we get to a number, if you add up all the generations, more or less about 57, 61 years, okay? That's the number that's usually on many of the, of the, of the uh, Jewish calendars that you'd see. Science gives a number that's slightly at odds with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you when the jokes are, okay? I got some jokes, but that, that, that wasn't one of them. That's sad. Okay. Now, science calls it the Big Bang. Physics, Torah calls it the creation. It's interesting to see 
the flow of information, how it, how it goes back and forth. The problem surfaced in our house, these are my socks, but in my socks I keep a stone. It's a, in Hebrew, it's a mi'uban. The word eben is stone, mi'uban. It's a, a fossil that's 150 million years old. It's the vertebra of a plesiosaurus dinosaur. My wife, Barbara Sofer, got it for me. We're married, but she was at a writing in Sofer. The, uh, got it for me in Montana. And when that rock came into the house, there was a major you know, problem. And we think, oh, we have five kids. My youngest daughter then was, Hani was five, was seven years old. She said, Abba, how can you have a 150 million year old rock in a house when the Bible says the world is even 6,000 years old? Well, poor Hani didn't get supper for the next two nights until she shaped up. <laughs> I did ask those kinds of questions. No, that's not, that's not really the case. I said, you know, maybe time back then was different, something along that line. And that was the approach that I used. But it, it's good for a child, but it doesn't work once you start studying uh, the biblical text in more depth. However, if, what is interesting, I think, to see is the, how science has changed in its opinion of the universe because it has major philosophical implications. The, uh, in 19, well, go, I'll go back earlier. In 1610, in 1610, a calculation was made of the age of the universe. It was made by none other than Archbishop Usher. Now, Usher wasn't just an, uh, was an, just, just an archbishop. He was archbishop for Ireland. And when Usher made the calculation, being a Bible person, I mean, what logically would he use to make the calculation? Not the latest astronomy in the 1600s, but the Bible. So he added up, added, 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 took his six days and added all the time from Adam forward, came to the end of the biblical characters, then went on to the kings and queens of Ireland and England, added, came to a number, subtracted it from the date, and found that the world was created in the year 4004 BCE, before the common era, in October, <laughs> on the 23rd. <laughs> Well, he didn't think it was so funny. The only, it was fortunate had he made the calculation on the 24th, it would have been a different number. However, there was a, there was a contemporary of Usher who was a scientist. His name was none other than Johannes Kepler. Now, when Kepler heard that a Bible thumper was going to calculate the age of the universe and giving data like this, he wasn't too happy because Kepler, as an astronomer, knew something about the universe, not necessarily the age, but in gener generality how the universe is structured, and he could make an intelligent es estimate of this. Kepler is the person who discovered that the planets were in elliptical orbits, right? He was almost burned at the stake for that because if God is perfect, what should the orbits be? Circular, of course. You'll notice the Torah makes no, the Bible makes no claims circular or elliptical, but the, but the knowledge on the street was, gee, the Bible must have wanted circular orbits and now we have elliptical orbits, the Bible must be wrong. The same is where the earth is located in the universe. A hundred years before this time, uh, Copernicus had convinced the world that the uh, earth goes around the sun. Now, the, the established religion, I'll just call it the church, no denomination implied, had said, well, no, the earth is the center. When it finally became clear that indeed, if you, uh, aside from these very complicated equations that might work in another way, that the earth does go around the sun, what's the opinion on the street? Oh, the Bible is wrong again. The Bible said the earth was the center. Now we know the sun's the center. The Bible's wrong. The Bible made no claim. In fact, the opening sentence of the Bible is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens come first. So the, uh, the unfortunate reality has been consistently, gee, science has proven the Bible wrong. Every time, the, so far, it hasn't been the Bible, that's, or the, the, especially the book of Genesis, that hasn't made those claims. Nonetheless, Kepler had a bit of problem with the, uh, with the religious establishment, talking about elliptical orbits in a world that should be made by a perfect God. He survived that. He confronted Usher about this silly calculation and said that he was clearly wrong. Kepler said it wasn't October, it was April. <laughs> That was 1610. That was 16, the early 1600s. Get another color here. Make it mac. 1959. 1959. 42 years ago. A survey is taken of United States science, North American scientists, U.S. and Canada, leading scientists of their opinion of the cosmos, the universe. The part of this, this survey was published in Scientific American, the most widely read science journal in the world. 
Among the questions asked these scientists was, what's your estimate of the age of the universe? Many questions were asked, not the age of the Earth, not the solar system, not the Milky Way, the whole kit and caboodle. What's the estimate of the age of the universe? And these were high energy physicists, astronomers, cosmologists that knew something about it, more than just biblical data. Two thirds of the scientists gave exactly the same answer. Exactly the same answer. It's a very big number. Any guesses? Infinite. Infinite, eternal. Beginning of the universe, they said? What a silly question. Well, the Bible says there's a beginning because, you know, people are afraid of dying. They want there to be something big in the world. But we know the universe is eternal. The timing is exquisite for the survey because just six years later, after the thousands of years, after the thousands of years that people abused about the age of the universe, just six years after, the, after this published survey, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson in the Bell Labs of New Jersey discover the echo of the Big Bang. And overnight, the idea of an eternal universe evaporated. The universe had a beginning. For all the laughter, for all the silliness, the argument between Usher and Kepler was in April, October, who was closer to the truth? Kepler and Usher with their argument? Or the two thirds of the scientists, the vast majority of scientists said the universe was eternal? Kepler and Usher. The Bible got it right. The numbers may be in question, but the Bible got it right. There was a beginning. Having a beginning to the universe is an amazing phenomenon. There was one physical creation before which there was neither time, nor space, nor matter. I, in, my, in my field, I know no colleagues that do not accept that. Our universe had a beginning. What happened before it, we have no idea. But the universe had a beginning that marked the beginning of the physical world, physical as defined by time, space, and matter. Something produced the universe that was not made up of time, space, and matter because that would be physicality and you have to go back earlier. Whatever produced the universe, it may not be God, Atheist says, thank God for that. The atheist, that's called a cheap, that's called a cheap laugh, okay? <laughs> the, the, what, whatever produced the universe, I'll call it metaphysical. I'll remove all spirituality from the word me metaphysical, just the fact metaphysical, outside the physical. Whatever produced the universe is not physical, because that's the universe. It produced the physical. Is eternal, that has had no beginning, because if it had a beginning, then something had to begin that. And it can make a universe, not physical, eternal, able to make a universe. Now that should sound real familiar. Some people spell that G-O-D. Physics has in fact discovered God. That's the reality. Something metaphysical, take the spirituality of the, out of the word, whatever your belief, whether you're an avid atheist or a believer that sees the divine in every molecule, every motion, no matter where you stand in the spectrum of belief, from atheist to absolute believer, agnostic in the middle, you believe in the metaphysical if you thought about your beginnings. Something produced the universe that wasn't there before. The universe has a beginning. The difference between the, the non-believer and the believer is the non-believer, there are many examples, we we'll call it a potential field. Physics would allow something from nothing by a scalar potential field to collapse and produce the universe. There are several theories that all pretty much go around that general aspect. A potential field produces the universe, or God produces the universe. If you spell God, that is your potential field, if you spell your God potential field, then your God is not interested in the universe it made. If you spell potential field, G-O-D, then your potential field is interested in the universe it made. And that's the difference between skeptic and believer. Is or is not there some clue that that which produced the universe is interested in the universe? But everyone accepts the metaphysical. Metaphysical being that which is outside the physical because that's what brought the physical into being. In 1965, we discovered there was a beginning to the universe. The Big Bang is probably the best news for God since Moses came down from Sinai because nothing matches evolution, age of the universe, all but nothing clear to the fact that there was a beginning. The only question remains is, when did that beginning, or a question that remains is, when did that beginning occur? And that's what I'd like to zero in on now. We have a creation line, 
begins about 15 billion years ago. Somewhere in the middle is Adam and Eve. Somewhere in the line is Adam and Eve. Then we have ending up something like a little less than 6,000 years. To put the problem again into another perspective, you're at Sinai. It's 3,400 years ago. You know, not a lot of, not a lot of like antibiotics weren't, who knew biotics, they don't antibiotics. You know, you cut your arm, you die of a degree, a disease, you have no idea what it was from. Travel was a distance you can go on a donkey in a day if you could afford a donkey, otherwise how you could walk in a day. It's about the primitive understanding of the universe. Moses says, wait for me down here, folks. God's going to tell me something about the universe. Moses goes up. Wow, what a story. Comes back down. He says, friends, I mean, I got a story to tell you. You won't believe this, but it took God six days to make the universe. Now, put yourself, this is 3,400 years ago. These people actually believed in God or gods or God. They believed in infinite gods. See, the problem at that time wasn't that six, that six days was too short. Six days was too long. Who wants a six-day God? I want God to, I want a loser of a God. Takes six days to, I mean, couldn't, bingo, you know, the Greeks could do like that in the Romans, but our God is schlepper up there, takes six days to make the universe? I mean, what kind of God you got going here? Who wants a God that takes six days to make a universe? So what's the message? The message is not that God's sleeping up there in heaven, if such a thing exists. It's that God works through nature. And time is part of nature. That's the message of the six days. And therefore, the only name for God used in Genesis chapter 1, the creation chapter, which starts with the creation of the universe and ends with the creation of Adam, the only name for God used is Elohim, that aspect of God that is manifest in nature. The whole kit and caboodle, the Yudke Vavke, the name we don't pronounce, Hashem, the eternal, however you want to say it, uh, isn't even mentioned in the first chapter. Because the aspect of God that builds the universe is, in fact, that aspect of nature. That's why things can go a certain way and, and not necessarily be right on course. That's for a different talk. Nonetheless, we have God using nature to make the universe. The question then is, did God make it 57, 61 years ago? Or did God make it 15 billion years ago? Or did the potential field make it then? So that's the question I want to zero on in the next, uh, next approximately 20 minutes or so. Rosh Hashanah. I mean, Rosh Hashanah, the new year, for those that don't know, Rosh means head, ha, the Shana, the head of the year. Rosh Hashanah, every Rosh Hashanah, you add another year. Two years ago, it was 57, 59. Rosh Hashanah comes again, 60, 61. Every year, you add another digit, another, uh, add another number onto that one. Rosh Hashanah service goes on forever. If you're just getting into Judaism, Biblical religion, Judaism, don't start with Rosh Hashanah, start with Purim. It's a lot more, <laughs> it's a lot more fun and easier on the brain, notwithstanding the hangover the next day. But suppose you made your mistake and you come to the Rosh Hashanah service and it goes on and on. Luckily, if you've gotten a ticket, I think they have tickets here in America also, we have tickets as well. You, know, you get a ticket in the back, you can close the book and take a little snooze because you know, can, you know it goes forever. Nonetheless, the sages knew everyone was sleeping. And so three times during the service, you are woken up, like it or not. And that is with the blowing of the shofar, the ram's horn. Everyone listens to the ram's horn. It's the most important act of the day, hearing the ram's horn blown. And everyone wakes up for it. No one sleeps through that. Three times, three separate times. And the identical sentence is said each time after the blowing of the shofar. Hayom harat olam. This is the birthday of the world. A simple reading of the text, this is the birthday of the world, would imply that Rosh Hashanah, the new year, falls where? Here. But actually, Rosh Hashanah does not say this is the creation of the world. Rosh Hashanah falls right here. The calendar that we count for the, our calendar has a six-day calendar that predates Rosh Hashanah, and the 57, 61 years as of last Rosh Hashanah starts from the creation of Adam. This calendar that you got home, hang it on the refrigerator and tells you when not to go to work or you know, you know what, how to behave one way or another. You know what, it should really say 57, 61 years plus what? Plus six days. That is Talmud. 1,600 years ago, the Talmud says everyone agrees, and that's pretty amazing for Judaism, everyone agrees that the six days 
do, are not part of the calendar, but the six days mark the, the time from the beginning towards the creation of Adam. The creation of Adam is not the creation of Adam's body. It's the creation of Adam's soul. Every line of Judaism holds by this. The creation on day six has nothing to do with Adam's body. Adam's body was around for a long time with this, before the soul was put into it. And then the neshama, the soul, was placed into Adam. And from that, the Hebrew word for the soul of a human, the neshama, starts and goes forward from here. That's the 5761 years that we have going on this side here. Just because of the audience, uh, just to make it clear, the word Adam, some people think Adam is some macho guy. Adam wasn't like in my day, John Wayne, hey Eve, let's go for it. That's not what's happening. Adam, as we see in Genesis chapter five, verse four, God created them male and female and called their name Adam. God created them male and female and called their name Adam. Adam was not a man, Adam was them male and female, whether it's androgynous or two separate beings, the Talmud debates this, but it's explicit statement. So I just, that's why I was starting Adam and Eve together. But those six days before Adam are separate from the calendar. They have been separate for 1,600 years and the Talmud doesn't say, gee, this is something new. They've never been part of the calendar because the description of time here for the six days is, and there was evening and morning day one, evening, morning, a second, evening, morning, evening and morning. In other words, the description of time for the six days is totally different from the description of time from Adam forward. From Adam forward, the flow of time is totally human. Adam and Eve live 130 years of the parents of Seth. Seth lives 105 years from the father of Anosh. From Adam forward, human events carry on the flow of time. From before Adam, it's kind of like cosmic, like someone looking in from the outside. There was evening and morning, this happens, evening and morning, that happens, and so on. So that's the origin of the calendar being separate but it's still six days. So as I said to Hannah, my daughter, when I, after I let her out of the room, you know, she, I said to her, you know, it's, it's, she was hungry by that time. She said, tell me anything, Abba. So I said, Psalm 90, verse four, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that passes. Maybe the days weren't days back there. And that's super for a kid that's seven years old and even 10, 12, but when you start studying deeper and deeper, you have to learn more and more about the world to understand what the Torah is saying and what the world is saying. The idea for looking for, looking for deeper truths in the Bible is no deep, different from looking for deeper truths in the world. That's what puts bread on scientists' table. If I behave myself and I get up early in the morning and I look over to the east, which is, uh, maybe it's that way, but I'm sure. Look to the east, I see the sunrise. Goes over, sun sets in the west. Get a good night's sleep, wake up in the early morning, sunrise. Sun sets in the west. Wow, there goes the sun around the earth. The simple reading of the universe is the sun's going around the earth. The deeper reading of the universe is the earth rotating its axis, makes it appear as if the sun's going around the earth. That earth rotating on its axis, the distance around the circumference is, is 24,000 miles. 24,000 miles all the way around on the equator. On the equator, if you're standing on the equator, and it's 24,000 miles around, and you go around in 24 hours, that's 1,000 MPH. You are moving at 1,000 miles per hour, which is far too fast for me. I don't lecture on the equator. I, up further north, it gets smaller. Here, we're only going at 900 miles an hour, and I'm surprised 90 seconds you wide doesn't have seat belts. At 900 miles an hour, that's rather embarrassing, but that's the reality, and there's no perception of it, because the simple reading of the universe is we're sitting still. The reality is we're moving at hundreds and thousands of miles an hour when you see all the dy dynamics of the cosmos. King Solomon talks about those deeper truths. In Proverbs 25, 11, he writes the following, a word well spoken is like apples of gold and dishes of silver. A word well spoken is like apples of gold and dishes of silver. And Maimonides says, what was King Solomon talking about? Why should a word well spoken be like an apple of gold in a dish of silver? And the guide for the perplexed, Maimonides answers it 900 years ago. He says, 800 years ago, he says, when you look at a dish from a distance, that's all you see, the beautiful silver dish. Only when you bring the dish close in, do you see what's inside the dish, the, silver, the golden apples. Maimonides says, what's the silver dish? The simple reading of the Torah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, phenomenal stories, valuable information. 
What's the golden apples? The subtleties in the text. And Maimonides writes, as gold is more valuable than silver, those golden apples in the silver dish expand the meaning way beyond the simple reading of the Torah into subtleties that you wouldn't re realize existed. And that's some of those subtleties we'll talk about now. The Gaon of Vilna, 250 years ago, brings his, his teachings are brought down, writes the following. When the light of Torah came into the world, it split into two parts. Only one part went to Sinai. When the light of Torah came into the world, it split into two parts. Only one part went to Sinai. The other part went into nature. And the time will come when those secrets of the Torah that are hidden in nature will finally be discovered and we will at last understand the Torah in a way we never understood it before. The Talmud in the section called Holidays becomes intrigued with the creation of the universe. And it goes word by word through the opening chapter of Genesis, trying to understand the meanings of the word and expanding them. For instance, I do this very quickly because I want to get to the, to the actual words that I'm interested in relative to tonight. But just to show how it's changing words meaning, it comes to the word hoshech. Anyone know what hoshech means? Darkness, exactly, in verse number four. Genesis chapter one, verse four, the fourth sentence of the Bible, hoshech means darkness. But two sentences earlier in verse number two, it does not mean darkness, the Talmud tells us. It means black energy. Interesting, identical, mayim, everyone, mayim? Water, on day three, but not day, days one and two, the building blocks of the universe, Maimonides tells us. Interesting. Finally, it comes, just jumping right to the last, the, this, the sentence that marks, and for Yehi Erev Evoke Yom Achad, there is evening and morning, day one. Erev Evoke is discussed, but most interestingly for us this evening is the order there. There is evening and morning, day. And the Talmud, in Hagiga, Hagiga the Hag means holiday, on the 12th page, decides that it's going to define the word Yom. Day. The text says there is evening and morning, day. And the next word is the number of the day. The Hebrew word is yom for day. And the Talmud goes out on a limb there, and it's going to tell us, it's going to define the meaning of the word day in the Torah, not from day four when the sun is mentioned, not from day six when Adam and Eve are mentioned, but on day one, the first of the days. And having just had a rock that was 150 million years old in my in my hand, I read the text with bated breath and to discover the most amazing thing of all. The Talmud saves the day by telling us that the duration of a day in Genesis, the six days each day is 24 hours. Then comes Rashi and says the days are 24 hours. And then comes the Kabbalah, the name of Nachmanides, 24 hours. You see, there's not a single ancient commentary that says the days were eras. Not a one. Now, why would a modern commentator say the days were eras? Oh, I know why. They've seen a rock that's 150 million years old. They've read Time magazine that the universe is 15 billion years old. So bend the Bible to match the science. Each of these commentators adds more information to the 24 hours. And finally, when you get to the most recent, eight or 900 years ago, Nachmanides, who says it wasn't his idea, he got it from his teachers, who got it from their teachers, who got it from their teachers going back. He says the following. What I learned from my teachers in these other commentaries is this. The days of Genesis are 24 hours each. Days as we know them, the duration is not longer than the six days of our work week, but they contain all the ages of the universe. The duration is not longer than the six days of our work week, but they contain all the ages of the universe. Nachmanides then goes and gives a description of the universe. He, give, he makes that statement in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus three times over. Six 24-hour days, days as we know them, like our work week today, he says, but all the ages of the, universe, ages of the universe are in them. Here is the description that Nachmanides brings to the early universe. It is the only description of the early universe. People that don't know biblical commentary say, oh, well, you can learn anything from the Bible. Maybe you can. But the ancient commentators have exactly one description of the universe, and this is it. Before the line, we have no idea what the beginning is about. Then from absolute nothing comes a tiny speck, a speck that's given a size between a grain of mustard and the size of the black of your eye. That's the entire universe. It didn't happen over there, over there, over there. It didn't happen in Jerusalem or in New York and Canarsie. It happened everywhere, because that's the entire universe. We were part of that speck. There's one physical creation. 
This is the only physical creation. Your bodies and mine and everything you see around us are 15 billion years old. No wonder you feel the way you do. There's been no further creation. Our bodies, not as bodies, were created as a ball of energy that changed into atoms, that changed into rocks and water, that changed into brains that could produce an Einstein and a Beethoven's violin concerto. That's quite a, a selection of, of events. If you think that chance right actions can change energy into a brain, that's, you've got a better imagination than I have. But the, the universe starts off with a speck. This is the only creation. Nachmanides says the speck was a speck of energy. The speck expanded out. The energy changed into matter. And he writes that when matter formed from the energy, the clock of the Bible began. He writes, time is created here at the creation, but the clock of the Bible begins only when stable matter forms from that energy. How he knew stable matter formed from energy, I don't have a clue. He says he doesn't know either, but he learned it from his teachers. This, this span of time that's excluded from the Bible to what would be called quark confinement, the, the first appearance of stable matter, protons and neutrons, lasted about one one hundred thousandth of a second. I didn't search for a beginning time of the clock. That was just the only point available that matches Nachmanides' statement. When stable matter forms, the clock begins. That's called quark confinement. Supposing you're back at this time, this being the only physical creation, the text of the Torah now reads, v'yehi erev, V'hi voker yom echad bimkoma yom rishon. The text reads, there is evening and morning day one. It might have read there is evening and morning a first day, because it says second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, the sixth day. So the question is, why does the text say there is evening and morning day one? I had a student, I always give it in his name, Paul Joshua from Sydney, Australia. He was studying in, uh, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem two years ago. And he said the following, he said, I understand why the text says day one from a 20th century example. I mentioned his name because it's a brilliant insight. He said the reason that the Bible says there is evening and morning day one is for the same reason that during the First World War, people called the First World War the Great War. Well, why don't they call it the First World War? Unless you were a pessimist, you didn't think there was going to be a Second World War. Yeah, they couldn't call it a First World War because they were seeing time from the beginning looking forward, from lifetime, from the, that war itself. Nachmanides says exactly the same statement. He says the reason that the Bible says there is evening and morning day one, Yom Echad, and not a first day, Yom Rishon, is because the, to the Torah sees time from the beginning of time Looking forward, it says, how old is the universe? Oh, about six days. We look back in time, we say, how old is the universe? Oh, about 15 billion years. Tech of the ninth, nine zeros after 15 billion years. And comes along Albert Einstein and says, you know what? You know what? They may both be the same. We'll go back here to the beginning. Right here the beginning, we're virtual people, like in, we're right at the clock is beginning right here. And we have a virtual labor, that obviously there's no people or there's energy back. We have a virtual laser. The universe is going to start here and it expands out. It expands out not by new space being created, all of cosmology, all the physics of the Big Bang says this is the only physical creation. It agrees one-on-one -on -one with, with the Kabbalah. The spec expands out not by new space being created, but by the original space doing what? Stretching and stretching, and that's fundamental to the understanding of the universe. That there's no new space, no new matter, no new energy, everything was there at the beginning. The space expands out, not into a vacuum, into who knows what. You know, you might call it God, call it a potential field, whatever you want, but it's expanding out. Whatever's on the other side of the universe, if the universe has an edge, no one has a clue. It may not have an edge. But supposing you were back at the beginning, you have a virtual laser, bingo, you send out a pulse of light. And one minute later, you send out pulse number two. Now, light travels at 186,000 miles a second. So between pulse number one and pulse number two, there's a lot of space. In fact, 186,000 miles. And the pulses travel and travel through time and space till they reach us in about four minutes before nine on the 14th of May, right here at the 92nd Street Y. By golly, what luck you came tonight. The first pulse arrives. Does pulse number two arrive a second later? Yes or no? No, 
because when you view information from a distance, this is standard cosmology. It's not Schroeder. It's not Asher Torah. Speak. It's not the Bible. It's the it's the part of the Bible that was wasn't given to Moses, but was the Gaon of Vilna said is inside the text, is inside nature. Pulse number one goes out, and as the pulses travel through time and space, space is stretching. Pulse number one arrives, and then much later, depending upon the stretching of space, pulse two arrives. Now we go a different story. We got a great storyteller back here at the beginning, a virtual storyteller. And it tells about six days worth of information. I mean, amazing stuff. The creation of the universe, light separating from dark, plants, I don't know, what an amazing story. It takes six days to tell the whole story. But, but of course, by the time we get that story, it's a lot longer than the six days, huh? Because we get it as we get it looking back in time. It's standard. If people want afterwards to ask questions, I have quotes from the leading cosmology textbooks that are used literally around the world. I can tell you because when I quote from the text, it's not necessary to quote here this evening unless someone wants it in questions. They say, yeah, it's the book we use also. It's pre Principles of Physical Cosmology that just discusses this in detail. I didn't figure it out. But it's used in astronomy every day of the week. That's clear. A star sent its light to us, and it's a blue star. Blue, blue has a very short wavelength, OK? It was a very short wavelength. But as that blue light travels through space, what happens to the wavelength? It gets stretched out. And what is a long wavelength? Red. The blue light leaves the star, and the red light arrives. Say, what a great, I mean, it's a beautiful red star. But if I want to know what that red star looked like when the light left the star, I have to go back in time. Not physically, but mathematically, is no problem. And if, my, how, if I know how far the star is away from us, how long that I travel as I go back in time, what is space doing? And the red light compresses to blue light. So it really is blue, but I only see red. The Torah sees six days from its perspective. The Torah chooses its perspective. Throughout the text, we're told by the commentators that the Torah chooses its perspective. It's mabat. Not a hill or a valley, it's moment in time. The moment in time the Torah uses is from here looking forward. All we would need to know is how much the universe has stretched. And the lovely nature of nature is we know exactly how much the universe is stretched. It's a high energy physics number. My doctorate's in low energy physics. Nuclear physics is not high energy physics. I have nothing to do with these numbers. I, I thank God I can read the texts and the, and the papers, but I just lift the number out. It's the same number in all the texts. We know the amount of stretching because we know the change in temperature, and it's one on one. Every time the universe doubles in scale, size is a simpler word, but you should use scale. Every time the universe doubles in scale, the perception of time halves. Triples in scale, perception of time by a factor three, quadruples by a factor four. All we need to know is the ratio of, of temperatures between here and here, and we then know the stretching, and we know it. The temperature here is what Penzias and Wilson got the Nobel Prize for, about three degrees above absolute zero, the temperature of space, about minus 450 Fahrenheit, about minus 270 centigrade. And the temperature back here was a trillion times higher. I have nothing to do with the numbers. I didn't search for a number. That's the number that came out. And it's the only perspective. It means a trillion is a one with 12 zeros after it. It's a big number. But what it means is if the pulses were one second apart back here, they would be a trillion seconds apart back today. If they were one hour apart here, they'd be a trillion hours. Conversely, if I had, let's say, I know, a trillion days worth of, in, who knows a trillion, the dinosaurs, who knows what, a trillion days worth of information and events. And I wanted to say, but the Torah sees time from the perspective it chooses. Day one, there was even morning day one, Nachmanides teaches us, I just said, what would happen? I would have to take that trillion days worth of information and run it back in time, and I would say, gee, those trillion days, if I divide it by the compression factor, would be appeared as one day. A trillion hours as one hour. A trillion seconds as one second. But we don't talk of hours and days. We say the universe is about 15,000 million, 15 billion years old. But that's how we see it. See, the other half of the sentence in Time Magazine or the New York Times or whatever you read, when it says the latest data say the universe is 14 billion years old or 15 or 16 billion years old, the other half of the sentence is as measured from the time-space coordinates of the Earth. 
Measure the times from the time space coordinates of the moon, you get a bigger number, because time goes faster on the moon. Measure from the t on the sun, you get a smaller number. Time goes slower. There's a certain amount of time that went by, but it as measured from what your coordinates determines what you get. We measure a 15 billion year old universe, that's our perception. But what would the perception be from back here? Well, I have to shrink that number by a trillion, which is easy, physics is not so difficult, crossing off zeros, 15 years divided by 1,000, or 0.015 years. The entire argument that had Hana in the room for all those days, that's not true actually, was 15 thousandths of a year. Who's worried about 15 thousandths of a year? And that's pretty much the talk this evening, except for the fact that it's hard to remember a decimal point like that. So I figured I'd change it into days by multiplying by 365. Any guesses for what you get? Look at this. Six days. See, the universe is six days old, and the universe is 15 billion years old, and that's the reality. No one debates that calculation. There may be people saying that it's chance, and it may be chance. I would never suggest that it wasn't chance. But when you look at the day-by-day -day fidelity of matching, which I do in, in the sec my second book, The Science of God, it's overwhelming. The days are not the same duration. Every time, this, every time the universe doubles in scale, the perception of time halves. So if these were the edges of the universe, the universe may have no edges, so if these are co-moving points in the universe, okay, when is the space between these co-moving points doubling the most rapidly? When they're close together or when they're far apart? close together. The early days have all the time folded into them. The first day, and had, the numbers just come out of the equations. I mean, Einstein figured it out. I just plugged the numbers in. The first day comes out to last eight billion years. Second, four, two, one, a half, a quarter. You add them all up, you get about 15, three quarter billion years. The universe is six days old. The universe is 15 billion years old, and they both happen in exactly the same time. I have to stop here now, and I'd like to take about 15 or 20 minutes worth of questions. Uh, and so if anyone has questions or if you get a second, can I get some, thank you, the light. And if there, uh, there you are, you are people out there. I thought I was, I thought I was, I was, I was talking to Newton, I uh, know to Edison. Well, I can use Edison, 150 watts. <laughs> yes. Time is part of the creation. It appears that before the universe, at least as we understand the Big Bang, there was neither time nor space nor matter. So time is part of our creation. It's hard to believe because the, one, the difficult in, 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 in perceiving a phenomena without this is every image that we have between in our brain, every image is made up of images of time, space, and matter. This, either your mind is completely blank, like your maybe brain dead or something, God forbid, or the image that you see always has time, space, and matter in it. It just always does. No matter what you, because what, if you didn't have time, that would be the problem with an image of time. There'd be no, and even then, there'd be time because you'd be seeing it over time. So I was wondering how come nature is not part of time? Time is part of nature. Space and matter. Well, why is nature, nature it's, it, that's what na nature is, time, space, and matter. Nature is time, space, and matter. You are time, space, and matter, plus a nefesh and a shama, the uh, spiritual creations of, of an animal and a human. That's, you know, nature, that's what nature is, what we live in. And the laws of nature somehow are, that's my, my, my newest book, the, the, uh, the Hidden Face of God, somehow those laws of nature are known by the particles in the world. The laws of nature like aren't out there working on things. An electron, the only, way I can say it is an electron knows the laws that govern electrons. I don't know how it knows it, but it, it follows the laws of nature. Who taught it the laws of nature? You can say that's just the way it is. But when you look at deeply the amount of complexity in the world, one begins to wonder whether or not there really is a consciousness that pervades the universe. That's the biblical message. The biblical message of hero is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The seventh grade meaning of that is, it's the Deuteronomy, it's the famous Shema, is that there's one God. But that's not, the, that's not that's the silver dish. The golden apple is, the Lord is one. There's a oneness that pervades the universe, and everything is aware of it, everything. And when you touch it as a human, you know it, because it goes right through your whole body. That's your neshama touching the oneness. When your individual self dissolves into this universal 
aspect of existence, this, one, this universal consciousness, you know it. And that's the message of the Shema. The Lord is one. There's a oneness. Question? Yes. Ah, uh, that's clear. That's yes. Well, it's why we celebrate is because the Talmud. They don't. The, the, the annoying thing about the Talmud is there's usually not reasons given. Okay, but the but Moses breaks the calendar into two parts. Rosh Hashanah, and it's interesting because all those times you read the sentence, this is the birthday of the world. You really, th and then it says, uh, well, I, no, I can tell you because here's there's two reasons now. I'll give you the, the second the second reason. I'll give you the first reason. Moses breaks the calendar into two parts. In his closing speech, he says, consider the days of old, the years of many generations. Uh, it's Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 7. Consider the days of old, the six days of Genesis, the years of the many generations, from Adam forward, from Adam forward, the flow of history. He says, you can see the fingerprint of God either in the phenomenal development of energy into life or in the phenomenal development of, uh, of the flow of social history. That's the, uh, that's the flow. But the sentence that we say following the blowing of the shofar, which everyone hears, there's no break, no Kaddish, no hallelujah, nothing. You blow the shofar, this is the birthday of the world, today we stand in judgment. It's ridiculous. What does the birthday of the world have to do with standing in judgment? Unless the birthday of the world relates to the creation of the soul. See, before the neshama, the world wasn't immoral, it was amoral. There's nothing wrong with a lion eating a person, except for the person, of course, and his family. I mean, it's natural for lions to want to eat people. But as Solzhenitsyn says, lions are right, cannibals are wrong. The reason the sentence says, this is the birthday of the world, today we stand in judgment, because the birthday of the world marks the creation of the neshama, the soul of human life, which lets you determine what pleasure is in the world in a way that is in relationship to this universal oneness, this achtut, this oneness that pervades the universe. And you reach for it or you don't reach it. That's why you can stand in judgment on Rosh Hashanah. Before the neshama, you can't stand in judgment. Question on that side? Well, let's get in the back. Uh, okay, someone starts speaking and I can't... You know, Right? Beautiful. Thank you for asking that question, because people would leave here saying, oh, you know, the shore is nicer than numbers, but let's face it. Okay. <laughs> Maimonides and the Guide for the Perplexed, part one, chapter seven, discussing the Hebrew word yalid, to give birth, writes the following. The English translation is not mine. It's the Friedlander translation from 1881, a book I inherited from my father, Zichron Rebecha, on of the Guide for the Perplexed. So I'll give you the English translation of it. Maimonides says, this is the year 1190 the book is written, okay? Before archeology, span before dating of fossils, Libby starts that in the 1945 or 46. He, Maimonides writes the following, it is well known, you gotta get this, it's well known that there coexisted and predated Adams beings that had the same, and he gives four adjectives that translate into English by Friedlander, that had the same shape, the same form, the same intelligence, and the same judgment. They just weren't human. Now, wait a minute. Same shape, form, intelligence, and judgment? They weren't human? I mean, what were they lacking? What were they lacking? Neshama. The neshama, yeah. See, the neshama is something different than whether you bury your dead or not. There's an excellent, in the, Lund in the British Museum, I copied it off the wall, this goes back, about three or four years ago, I presume it's missed over there, a plaque in the Mesopotamian room. The British Museum in London, it's worth a trip there just for this. There is a bastion of secular knowledge, okay? There's nothing, there's no God's, God problem. You know, the G word is not popular in the British Museum. I don't know if they're for or against, but there's no evidence whatsoever. On the wall in the Mesopotamian room is, is a plaque that starts off the first large cities, dot, dot, full colon. The first large cities, before 5,500 years ago, notice how similar this is? They're just rounding it off to hundreds of years. Before 5,500 years ago, small settlements and villages existed. But about 5,500 years ago, there was a change in scale. Then it mentions the first, five, first few cities, 
And it says, but by far and away, the most important invention of the time was writing. The British Museum is aware that the Tower of Jericho is 10,000 years old. The British Museum is aware that farming was invented 9,000 years ago, that lamps with wicks were invented 8,000 years. For you women, that, even men who light candles on Friday night, take a look at the wick, and you'll notice there's the wax, and then there's part of the wick that's not burning, and then there's the flame above it. But the flame doesn't go right back to the wax. There's a little bit of wick. Think it through. They figured it out 8,000 years ago. They had all the brains you need. They had the same shape, form, intelligence, and judgment. Adam had sex with them and had children. The Redak, the, the uh, commentator in the year 1200, said these were Bani Mamash, actual children. They just weren't human. Adam wasn't having sex with an alligator. Adam was having sex with not, we have, uh, hominids that were female. Maimonides, Nachmanides on the verse, uh, chapter two, verse seven, this, this is like two hours of talking exactly one and a half minutes. I have to end, I think, in about, in about five, I have about, I about eight more minutes of time. The, uh, Maimonides, Nachmanides on the sentence, God takes dirt from the ground, puts the neshama in, that's the neshama, chapter two, verse seven of Genesis, and it says, nefesh chaya, and man became a living being. But the Hebrew says, and men became to a living being, T.O. So the Lamed, the T.O., is superfluous, Nachman, he says, so he ran around erasing the Lamed. No, that's not what he did. He said, there's nothing superfluous in the Torah. It's telling you something. Why does the text say, and man became to a living being? And he says, this Lamed, the T.O., always comes to show a, translation, a transition. And after two pages of commentary of talking that maybe, uh, maybe Adam went through the stages of the soul of a plant, the fish, the land, you know, the whole Darwinian type stuff, or Darwinian is like Nachmanis actually, he says, he says the following, or it may be that there was a completely living being and God put the neshama into that being and that being nehefach le'ish acher. Anybody know Hebrew? changed into a different man. No, not Nefach Ish. If it's a longer time, I always start with that, and people say, oh, different man. A different man, Ish Acher, which means before the Neshama, there was a man. Just wasn't human, huh? The change that happens here is from man to human. I can't say it with woman because it doesn't work that way, but that's the reality. Maimonides describes these people and they learn it, not pulling out of the Kabbalah, never pulls from the air. Look at the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five of Genesis. Read it about 20 times, not skimming it, paying attention like you do to New York Times editorial. Pay attention to every word and you will notice that Adam separated from Eve for 130 years. And while Eve was home mind in the fort, Adam was out on the town, <laughs> siring children. Now, the Talmud calls these beings demons. And friends, if you're married, and you know, your wife catches you, she'll call them demons also. Uh, and that's the reality. There has never been a problem with the age of the universe. There's never been a problem with the, with the Tower of Jericho being 9,000 years, uh, not, not about 9,000, 10,000 years old. Those just weren't problems. The first large cities, but the most important event of the time was the invention of writing. Why? Nice thing about, that marks the beginning of history also. Everything before writing is prehistory. Pictures on a cave, the bison may be good, the bison may be bad. Maybe they wanted to eat it, maybe they wanted to train it as a pet. Maybe they wanted to worship it. You don't know what the bison's all about. You got a picture. But with writing, you know what it's about. The nice thing about writing is we know what the writing was about. It wasn't Aleph Bait writing, it was uh, hieroglyphics, pictographs. The first writing is totally bartering. It wasn't praise of God, it was bartering. Because bartering was invented, writing was invented because bartering was invented. Bartering was invented, it's very well known why. Because the first large cities are invented. And once you have a large city, Sam in the city wants to sell his baskets to Frank on the farm. Sam's baskets are ready, he goes out to Frank on the farm, here's my baskets. Frank on the farm says, gee Sam, you know, I need the baskets, but the corn won't, be, corn won't be ripe for two more weeks that I'm going to pay you with. Frank from the city, Sam from the city says, write me out. You know, make it clear you owe me five bushels of corn in place of these baskets. Writing is invented because bartering is invented. Bartering is invented because the first large cities appear. The only question that remains is, why do the first large cities appear right at the time that the Torah says, Adam appeared, and then Hashem came into the world. The Talmud's well aware of cavemen, just calls them different things. Uh, my guess, now this, is, now this is modern commentary, and it's totally my guess. 
Large cities appear at this time because the neshama is created, completely spiritual, and it changes the world from a dog-eat-dog, -dog, literally world, to a world in which there is moral responsibility. The world changes from an amoral world to a world with moral responsibility. This is the birthday of the world, today we stand in judgment. And with moral responsibility and awareness of this oneness, suddenly people can get together in the evening and listen to some guy harangue them about the age of the universe, you know, and no one's thrown a chair at me and said, I want to go kill my neighbor. Yet, but wait till road rage happens while you're driving home. <laughs> yes, I have to end, wait, I, no, I have a, two or three more questions, yes. Space, as far as the physical creation goes, there may be something that predates slightly the physical creation, the Torah calls it wisdom, but as far as the physical creation goes, time, space, and matter start right here. The first matter was in the form of energy, but time, and this was the only space. You're in that speck now, but the speck has created out. Remember, when we think about the cosmos and the universe, we're not looking at something else, we're looking at our history. We got 15 billion years of physical history inside. We were stardust. We were a ball of energy 15 billion years ago. We were rocks and water 5 billion years ago. That's all that's going on the Earth, rocks and water. When the Earth cools, you got rocks and water. 3.8 billion years ago, life starts right after the Earth cools and liquid water forms. That's one of the big problems with evolution. Earth is molten, Earth cools, liquid water forms. The oldest fossils go back to the earliest liquid water on the Earth. It starts like that, not after billions of years of evolution. We were once, we got rocks and water in our genealogy, which explains the neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Are we going into what? Matter. Oh, matter. Big Bang is, uh, the Big Bang is the creation of the universe. That Big Bang produced you 15 billion years ago as, as, a, as a ball of energy that changed into a person that can think and you know, be a human. It's amazing. I just go back. Way in the back, was someone in the back there? I think I have, I have, I think I have to end in about two minutes. Okay, all these questions in detail are in the science of God. Every question that's been asked, uh, asked today and the idea of the metaphysical is in the, in the, so if you want a detailed answer, I'm not, I'm not pushing a book, but I'm just saying this is there. Nachmanides, what happens day, day three, we have uh, land and water and we have the first plant life, okay? And then day four is the sun. First of all, there's a nuance on day three that's interesting. The word creation is not mentioned on day three. God, the biblical claim is God does not create life. The universe is made for life. If God had to create life, the statement would be God created life. You'll notice the word creation does not appear on day number three. The creation that produces life is right back to the beginning. The universe is tuned for life. That's the biblical claim. The problem that comes up from a simple reading of the text is silver dish is why is the sun mentioned on day four? If you look at it carefully, the, uh, both Rashi and the Talmud point out how the sun was already back earlier than day three, perhaps day one or day two. It's only mentioned on day three, on day four. Nachmanides says, again, this is the, Nachmanides the Mikubal, says that, and he only says this for plants. He says that the plants that are mentioned on day three did not develop on day three. It was an ongoing act that they, that they are mentioned as one group to leave them as a lump so that you don't have to mention each type of plant throughout the days because the Torah wants to zoom in to human life. The six days of Genesis are zoom lens. The first day is the universe. By day three, it's only the earth. By day six, it's only humans and the line that's gonna lead to Noah. So the Torah didn't forget about the universe, but it's only interested as the zoom lens is, zoom, in six days. So the Torah wraps up plants on day three. The sun, according to the Talmud, was already there on day one or day two. Clearly, for a book that's been a bestseller for several thousand, it's been around for so many thousands of years, the author realized that there would be a problem on having the sun on day four. There's a reason why the sun is mentioned on day four. 
The reason on the, for the sun is mentioned on day four is to make you look for the deeper meaning of there was evening and there was morning. See, how do you have evening and morning for the first three days? You get to day four. I mean, I could see God writing the book. You know, oh, God, I forgot the sun. I get to day four. <laughs> no, no, it's a problem. Of course, he had a, had he had a word processor cut and paste you back to the beginning. They were working in stone back then. That wasn't the reason. The text doesn't say there was evening and morning. The text says there was Erev and Boker just to do everything very, very quickly. The, the root meaning of Erev is not evening. That's the derived meaning. The root meaning of Erev is chaos. The root meaning of Boker is orderly. The, the derived meaning of chaos is evening because when the sun sets, vision becomes chaotic. It's not my idea Nachmanides taught of that a thousand years ago. The root meaning of Boker is orderly. When the sun rises, it becomes clear. The text isn't saying, in the silver of this reading is evening and morning. The golden apple is, there was disorder and order. And the Torah wants you to be amazed that you started with a ball of energy, totally chaotic, no structure, a plasma, and you end up with a symphony of life? That you can get order out of chaos? It never happens, never. Notwithstanding the work in Arizona and Kaufman, the fact is you never get stable order, the key is stable order, out of random reactions. You can get far from equilibrium, temporary order, but if that order is not locked into place, you lose the order. I just give one example, then I have to, I have to, I have to stop at this point because I, I think I'm two minutes over time. The ex because I want to make that clear, that order doesn't arrive. I want to get, let's say, a sentence by random reactions. I went to the store to buy a bottle of milk. Simple sentence, not a lot of words. So I get about 40 or 50 combinations of the English language, uh, English alphabet, shake, 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 shake in a bag. That means not equilibrium. And I, and I, look, and I look for com letters that are four, wow. W-E-N-T, <laughs> that guy showed us off the wall. Went, the first shaking I got went. I went to the store, I want to get it, went to the store. I got went, the first shaking. I shake some more. S-T-O-R-E, store. Ha <laughs> ha. But what happened to the word went in the shaking? It's lost. That's the nature of the world. If you don't lock order in, order becomes chaotic. And that's what the Torah wants you to be amazed about in the subtlety of Vihi Ed Vivoker. There was evening and morning. The deeper meaning is there was disorder and there was order. And you go to higher and higher stages till you end up with life. The Bible wants you to be amazed about that. You can say it's random reactions until you run through the numbers. And then you see the numbers make it very hard to understand how random reactions can take rocks and water and produce a violin concerto by Beethoven. Or an equation by Einstein or a loaf of bread. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I'm almost certain what happens, though, there is, I think there's some books there. I'm happy to sit and sign. And if there are questions, I'm very more than willing, if you come wherever I'll be, I'm not sure where I'll be, to answer questions. I have, I have until tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.